So uh, I'm very pleased to be introducing Peter Littlewood, who is a longtime friend, adversary on matters theoretical, <laughs> uh, a colleague, a marvelous colleague in every other way, and a great good friend. Uh, Peter did his undergraduate work at Cambridge, had a year at MIT. He told me that he didn't stay on at MIT because the person with whom he worked, Bruce Patton, didn't get tenure. That sent him back to Cambridge, where he worked with a wonderful theoretical physicist named Volker Heine. Peter said he an absolute marvelous kind of mentor. He saw Peter about once a year. <laughs> uh, Peter got his PhD, then went to Bell Labs, where he was first a postdoc and then stayed on as a member of the staff for some 19 years. Cambridge attracted him back to the Cavendish, where he was a professor, then head of the department. And uh, he realized sometime in the last year or two that uh, he could no longer make a difference at Cambridge. I can say to you that while he was there in his years at Cambridge, roughly what, about again, about two decades, one, one and a half, 15 years. 15 years. Right. He did make a difference then. He realized he could no longer make a difference at Cambridge. He got a marvelous offer from Argonne to be the associate director with major responsibility for basic science and, as you will hear, the physics of sustainability. Peter Littlewood. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, David. That, that's very kind. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and a number of things that actually comes to mind. The first one is I remember a, a complaint by Bob Dines um, who you know, of course, very well, where Bob said he knew when he was getting past it, when he was asked to give talks only after dinner. <laughs> um, uh, so, you know, it may be, may be too late. You know, a, 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 another one actually is, is that's common with David, is that, that, that indeed we've had a, a, a relationship which has always been convivial but occasionally adversarial. And I, the, I do remember one time where we shared the podium one after the other giving talks. And uh, at the end of my talk, which came second, one of the audience said, is there anything that you two could agree on? <laughs> and we looked at each other, and after a while we both came up with the statement actually that it's clear that at least one of us is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's, that's where we, we, we've been for a long time. But, uh, but I say that the, 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 the point about doing science, of course, is that you do spend a lot of time um, in an essentially adversarial point of view. And it's particularly difficult when you come to subjects like sustainability, where the necessities of science that you actually expose ideas and thoughts and data to great scrutiny also sp spill into the political arena, where those kinds of disagreements are very easily misused, and also people come uh, with a viewpoint uh, about the subject, which is not born out of data or out of science, uh, but, out of, uh, but out of prejudice. So, I mean, the purpose of my talk is, is, is to ask questions. Um, and, you know, this is the obvious question to ask when you come to sustainability. Um, and, you know, and I take the attitude, actually, that it isn't going to be much point in trying to get a sustainable society if it involves reducing us to the Stone Age. People won't do that. And I also think that we need to be in a situation where we assume that the status quo will be that the rest of the planet will have a standard of living which is at least as good as ours. Um, uh, and, the, no, and then, of course, the question, since I use physics in the title, what on earth does physics have to do with that? Um, and physics for the purpose of this talk is in fact really a way of thinking. Um, it's a way of insisting on focusing on the data, insisting on focusing on models. Um, and by the way, I hope you'll interrupt and complain. Okay. Now, so the first thing about sustainability is that everybody is optimistic. 
Um, you know, if I'm going to need to find a way of walking around here so I don't trip over this, this is better, so I can see what I'm talking about. Um, so there's a recent poll um, reported on the BBC, but it was a globe scanned poll, which means that somehow they did a global poll of what's going on, and this is, this is the optimistic view of the public. Um, a sort of Panglossian uh, statement, but this apparently is what our colleagues believe. Um, uh, even banks actually are optimistic about this. So this one I really like. I mean, I, I gave a talk recently in Scotland, and you, and you probably know HSBC has these really annoying adverts when you're exiting the plane, and this is one of them, and this is one of the things with this wonderful statement about 0.3% of solar energy on the Sahara could power Europe. I mean, it's very nice since we just took over Libya again, so we've got part of the solar uh, to, to work with. And of course, I mean, the question about things like this, you know, is it true? Is it false? Or actually, is it a fantasy? Because that's a third alternative um, when, you're, when you're facing bland statements like this. Um, so so the, the, the purposes of my talk actually are to try and turn you into one of those annoying armchair experts that you meet at dinner parties or at parties and because this is what physicists are. I mean, you so you understand that the role of a physicist at a dinner party is the guy who pronounces that they understand everything about everything and this is the way you should run your life because this is what we do. Um, and, and, and I would like to educate you to the level where you can do that and be an armchair expert because the whole point about thinking in the way you do is, is that it enables you to make grand... Uh, assumptions, prognostications. I mean, now, I, for example, now I come from Chicago. There's a famous story about Fermi, who said an entrance exam uh, for students, with the question being to estimate the number of piano tuners in Chicago. Okay. okay. Uh, and so the question is, why on earth is that a physics question? Of course, it is a question. About, uh, about using data wisely to make rational estimations. And if you think about that hard, it is quite straightforward to estimate the number of piano tuners in Chicago, even though when first faced with it. Right. But I, I would like you to do that with, with, with the globe. And I have a few principles, actually, uh, which I suspect will get me into trouble, because I am indeed an armchair expert, and the, one of the difficulties about talking about sustainability is that invariably I know a little bit about everything, and that in the audience there will be some expert who knows far more than I do about any single one of these topics, and I'm sure I will meet one of you tonight and he will come and, and harass me over this, but that, that's part of the point. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk about some grand principles, and you'll see these coming through, and the first one, which I deeply hold, is the value of theory over data. Now, this is not what we teach students, actually. We teach students that science is all about uh, the garnering of empirical knowledge, and the data has primacy over everything else. And of course, that's not quite right, because what you do is that you use data, of course, first to build a theory, and once you have a theory which is absolutely rock solid, you are really loath to throw that out. Um, and it's very easy, particularly in this game, to get fooled by incomplete, dangerous, bad data, but there are principles going around that you should use. Um, and you know, one of them I'll talk in a moment actually about global modeling and detailed modeling. And the trick is to use some rules and not lose the wood for the trees. And also in, in, to understand that the system is actually operating in a mode which I would call close to linear response. And if you don't understand what that means, I will explain it. Namely that we're dealing with a system which is perturbative and the changes are rather small. That is also not what you will read in the literature. Because people are full of feedback and nonlinearities and stuff like that. But actually, there are, you know, I mean, th th that's, a, that's a fiddle. I'm, I want to talk about thermodynamics of the planet because that's rather important. And we'll see that that really is critical. I'm going to talk about equipartition. So the foundation of thermodynamics is that if you put energy into a system, it disperses into all of the modes more or less equally. It's a founding, so it's why when we model a gas, you don't do it by trying to measure the velocity of every single molecule in the gas. 
you understand that there is something called the pressure and the volume and the temperature and that those three things are the equation of state and the reason that you can use that is because the degrees of freedom are well mixed and I will present you a case actually that the relevant degrees of freedom for renewables are all unfortunately for our purposes actually very well mixed and that makes the point actually that that, that free energy isn't free um, uh, and it will get us to the idea of money and I will try and make the bold statement actually that we're about that we are re that we are about to rewrite the laws of economics in favor of thermodynamics and that actually money is now energy um, so I don't know whether you will buy any of this but I hope it will produce some debate okay so okay so what, what am I actually going to talk about I'm going to talk about thermodynamics of the planet large-scale physics I will talk about uh, sources and sinks of renewable energy, where we can get energy from, where it has to go, and point out some of the global problems that we have to deal with, in particular, why, although there is plenty of energy around, it's dispersed so broadly that any, all of our renewables will have to be deployed on scales which are country-sized. Okay? And that's an important result. I will talk but not very much, although I'm prepared to, you know, in discussion, to talk in details about the headroom of innovation we have on transformative energy technologies, uh, in particular for generation and storage uh, of, of electricity and use and transmission. Um, uh, but in fact, not that much. I mean, some of this will come because partly because I don't have a lot of time. Um, and one of the problems, and this has occurred to me, is that if you approach this subject as a scientist or as a technologist, um, you assume that there's going to be some scientific or technological fix. Right. Um, so that inherently I believe that if I invent something better, that will be it and the problem will be all fixed. And it doesn't take very long before investigating this before you realize that it is a much more complicated problem and that in particular money matters a great deal and, so and socioeconomics matters a great deal and that this is very an un very, a very unpredictable path and that the scientific things that we are good at are only part of it. So there are a few things I won't talk about. I won't talk about nuclear, uh, not because I'm anti-nuclear or anything about that, just because it isn't really a renewable and it isn't part here. I won't talk at all about resource use or about water or things like that. Again, not because they're not important, just because it doesn't fit quite here. I'm probably not going to talk much about policy. Um, uh, and, and I won't talk about climate change. Well, actually, maybe I will. Um, so, in fact, I will start by talking just briefly about climate change because I want to use it to, uh, um, to tell you why theory is better than experiment. So let's see if you believe me. Okay. So the question is, do you believe in global warming? And what is the basis on which you would make a decision about whether global warming was actually happening? Okay. So the usual way this is presented is with a couple of graphs that look like this. Okay. This is data. So the first one is the atmospheric CO2 measured in Hawaii from 1960 to 2010, growing inexorably. Uh, annual oscillations on top of it, really very solid uh, data set. Here's another one which comes again from NASA Goddard. It is the best consensus of what's called the global land ocean temperature interest, namely the average trend in the temperature of the planet. Okay. Now you sort of look at this and that also looks like it's going up over this period. Okay. Now, you know, if you're dumb, you just sort of assume that one is related to the other, and clearly this is driving that. Anybody who has any smarts looks at this and says, mm, well, I'm not really sure. How good is your data? Can you convince me that there aren't systematic changes in how you've measured the data that would have skewed this curve? Okay. Even if you believe that it's really going up, how do you know it isn't just a fluctuation? Who knows what the correlation time is of temperature across the planet? Even if you believe that this is a real and this is a real trend, uh, you know, is this really a correlation? And lastly, are they causal? Something else could be doing this, right? So, uh, so, so, so just looking at these two things together is in fact not at all good evidence that this caused that. 
um, uh, you know, no more than the well-known correlation between eating ice cream and drowning. Very well established correlation between eating ice cream and drowning. Don't eat, eat ice cream because you might drown. Okay. Uh, so, I'm a theorist, and actually I believe that this guy is actually much more important in establishing what's going on, and this is Fante Arrhenius. Okay. Uh, and in, he's a, the, no, you, you will have heard of him because of the Arrhenius law. Actually, interesting background. You know, the work for which he won the Nobel Prize, um, barely got him past his PhD thesis. He got a fourth class PhD degree uh, on the basis of work which was, lately, which was later to get him the Nobel Prize. He barely made it through. However, in 1896, he published a paper in a, uh, in a journal called On the Influence of Carbonic Acid, namely CO2, in the air upon the temperature of the ground. And in that paper, he established uh, the basic fundamental model by which we understand uh, um, global warming. Um, and it's a bit of uh, maths. And let me just do this for you, because it isn't very hard. So here are actually some equations. Okay? So what Arrhenius pointed out is things that people already knew, is that firstly, without an atmosphere, the Earth would actually be rather cold. And we know this with absolute certainty, because what actually happens? Well, here is the ground. It's at some temperature. Energy comes in from the sun. Um, by definition, it, it turns out to be a quarter S0. S0 is the solar flux, which would, be which would be incident on a disk, which is the projected area of the Earth. If you average over the, over the angles and the rotations, you get a quarter of that on average, which comes in. Some of that is reflected straight back out. That's the albedo of the Earth. That's about 30% of it goes straight back out. The rest of it is absorbed. And it is, of course, re-radiated at the temperature of the Earth according to something which is known as Stefan's law, namely sigma t to the fourth. And just to demonstrate that here's a number we know really well, sigma is 5.670373 to the something. Okay. So we know this number very well. This is a fundamental constant of nature. Um, and you can solve this, okay? No moving parts. It's very straightforward. The temperature in the absence of an atmosphere would be minus 18 degrees C. Okay. By the way, this works for Mars exactly. Okay. Now let me give you a calculation which works exactly for Venus. Venus has an atmosphere which is uh, opaque. And Venus is very hot because the reason is, of course, that there's... Uh, it is, of course, closer to the sun, so the solar flux is higher. But nonetheless, of course, what happens is the solar flux comes in, there's some reflected out, and then the surface is at some temperature, which we don't know yet, and that is radiated up into the atmosphere, but it's absorbed by clouds. Those clouds are at a different temperature, and crucially, they then re-radiate uh, uh, at, at a different temperature, but, of course, they re-radiate in two directions. Some goes up and some goes down. I can solve these equations too. And if you do that, then the surface temperature turns out to be plus 30 C. Okay. Right. Uh, um, now, you know, what I'll point... No, so this, in some sense, is, is... Of course, there's a parameter here which might change, namely alpha. Probably plus 30 is a bit high on the upper end because if there are lots of clouds around, the albedo of the planet would probably increase and therefore there will be slightly more energy which would actually be reflected. Uh, you know, but nonetheless, this sort of brackets the two ends. Okay? And the Earth is somewhere in between. Because the atmosphere is partially transparent, and so the energy which is radiated from the surface of the ground, some fraction of it will go through the atmosphere, and then, that fr the, then some fraction will be absorbed and will be re-radiated. And epsilon, we now know, is about... 0.78, okay? And this, by the way, now is a number that we know very well. This has enormous spectroscopic evidence. Alpha you can measure by going out in a satellite and getting all of these things. Of course, the model is a bit simplified. But nonetheless, it comes out with a sensible-looking number, which is about halfway in between the two bounds, which is kind of what you would have expected. Okay? Now, by the way, we're not trying to calculate the temperature of the Earth. What we're trying to use is we're trying to use 
this calculation to estimate the sensitivity of the temperature of the Earth to changes in epsilon. Because, of course, what will change epsilon is putting in gases into the atmosphere that will absorb, and one of those is CO2. There are, of course, others that do this. Okay. So now let's go through this, right? So the first thing is that this model is vastly oversimplified. You might think it will be much better to have a really, de really detailed model of climate modeling and climate, I mean, the, the sort of, you know, micro eddies and God knows what else you want to put in. But the thing which is really good about this thing, this model, is it satisfies the first law of thermodynamics. The energy that comes in is the energy that goes out. Okay. Um, it is you know, absolutely defined upon some rules, and it depends on a, couple, on a couple of approximations. One of the approximations is that, in some sense, the atmosphere is well mixed. Of course, we know that you know, the temperature in the Sahara is not the same as the temperature of the North Pole, but they are very strongly coupled, so the perturbations to one will change the perturbations to the other. And we know the rate at which that happens, and one can try and study that. There are a bunch of few parameters which are very well known. Alpha and epsilon need to be measured, but of course epsilon is a spectroscopic number. Uh, you can really do this out. Alpha involves best these days going to a satellite and measuring it, and sigma, as I say, is a, is a constant of nature. So we know, by the way, that doubling CO2 changes epsilon by 0.02. That is also a you know, absolutely straightforward number that just depends on chemistry and spectroscopy. How does that change all of the other terms in here? Remember that the energy coming in was 345 watts per square meter. That, that change by 0.02 would change the so-called radiative forcing in the parameters by 3.7 watts per square meter. So that's the change in the numbers that are accused by this. So that is 1% of the total. That's comfortingly small, by the way. Um, but of course, when something changes by a very small amount, then you know that it is quite likely that I can use linear response. Because if something changes associated with this and something changes associated with that, you know, I mean, all kinds of things could be changing, but I can say to the level of doing linear response, um, I, the, I, this 1% change will produce a, an additive response with all of the other changes that might be going on, which are actually 1.2 Kelvin from that number. Uh, and so, no, this is an assumption about the system being linear. And now we get to discuss feedback. And of course, there are nonlinearities, and the nonlinearities that one can talk about, and they're mostly H2O, because, of course, making the world hotter means that there's more water vapor in the atmosphere, and water vapor is actually a much bigger greenhouse gas than CO2. Right. Um, uh, there are changes in the albedo. Uh, principally associated with things that people really do argue about, namely ice cover uh, near the North Pole. Um, there's, of course, changes in cloud cover. It may go up, may go down. Uh, but most of these feedbacks appear to be positive, and, of course, there are various things that people are now discussing associated with methane release uh, from the Arctic. But what I would like to point out, however, is that these are, in some sense, secondary causes. If you want to understand what CO2 does, what you do as a physicist is you do perturbation theory. I start by calculating the linear change, and then I say, well, that linear change introduces other changes, and I can calculate those too. And you can do that actually systematically in a way which gets you very close, actually, to 3 Kelvin, and that turns out to be the consensus from modern global climate models. Okay. And so these things are not a mystery, right? I mean, so this is not some black box into which somebody can fiddle the data you can do these analyses yourself on the back of the envelope and you can get very good numbers. And by the way, Arrhenius got two degrees in 1896. Um, so, so that's sort of, a, no, the, um, you know, sort of an encouragement actually to believe that, that you can analyze these problems and you can analyze them in your armchair. And where you need the data, the data is available and you can go and get it. Okay. Yeah. You're in slightly nervous about doing that. Indeed. So, so the, the, well, as I say, so there are various other things that you can look at. So the other thing is it may not help, but I gave you a bounded answer, which was, which was 20 Kelvin, right? Which is what happens if we make the, if we make the planet, uh, um, 
you know, if we make the, if we make the planet uh, really, you know, um, you know, completely opaque, right? Um, so there is some positive nonlinearity of feedback which is coming in. And by the way, I'm not sure I trust this number either, right? But what I do know is that I'm beginning to understand how this number is bounded by very simple ways. And as I say, that, no, that, that, that you, you, you worry about, you know, are there very complicated feedbacks that we really haven't dreamed in? But remember that, that a priori, right, we're talking about 1% changes in forcing. These are not enormous numbers. The reason that they produce big effects is that we sit unfortunately, on this cusp of a partially transparent atmosphere. We had no atmosphere or a complete atmosphere, none of this would matter. David, you had a good point. There's another way to look at it. I think it's probably <laughs> correct to say that there's more CO2 up there than there's been in the history of the planet. Mm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I guess I don't know that, actually, but... but the, I disagree. I absolutely disagree. Because I think, the, no, the, the course you don't know the outcome, you know, you can decide whether the North Atlantic gyre is going to get turned off and bad things are going to happen in Scotland. That's a minor perturbation that is completely energy conserving in all of this. No, I meant it in terms of, we don't know whether it could turn out to be six degrees oh. or not three. Yeah, I mean, no, no, it, yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I, I mean, so, so the, indeed. So, the, I mean, the, the point I was trying to make about this is, firstly, it ain't zero, right? Secondly, the other point I'm trying to make is that when somebody tries to flim-flam you, say, well, maybe the sun has changed. Well, the sun could have changed too, and that would have been an additive or subtractive response. And indeed, the sun, the solar flux does change a great deal on this scale, historically, and that will change uh, the response of the planet too. But I will stick by my view that actually I can do this with a perturbative analysis if I look on a global scale. Now, by the way, that's up for debate, and there are obviously people who don't like it. As you say, if I double my answer by doing second-order perturbation theory, I get nervous. Um, yeah. The yeah. That's yeah, that's right. So the, the yeah. So that's very interesting. That we're kind of stuck. So so yeah. So so there, I mean, there's sort of some interesting observations in here that you start ju just looking at in doing this. But but I say that the um, you know, don't necessarily be fooled. I think that more complex models are necessarily better. It depends on what question you want to answer. Um, and actually, by the way, I'm very suspicious of the numbers which are being quoted with methane. Because if I start doing a back-of-the-envelope calculation that estimates how much methane might actually be there based on, you know, how much energy goes in and input and how long it's been sitting there and all of that kind of stuff, it's not obviously as big as people claim. Um, so, you know, I mean, so, I mean, all of these things are worth really thinking about. And, you know, you as students can have a real opinion and you can sort this out. Um, so, let me move a bit, actually, to down from really global to where sources of renewable energy are in the needs of the planet. So, 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 I mean, so fundamentally what happens, here, so here's the mean radiative solar flux. You know, that's actually quite a lot of energy. So what happens to it? Well, of course, it gets thermalized. It turns into heat, it turns into wind, it turns into waves, and it turns into rainfall. And those are basically the sources of... Uh, renewables that you might have. So how, how, much, how much do we need? Well, <clears throat> the average power consumption in the USA is three terawatts. That's five billion microwave ovens continuously on if you want to do that. Uh, but it's also the solar flux on 10,000 square kilometers, which is the area of Delaware and Rhode Island taken together. So remember the comment from HSBC, well, only 0.3% of the Sahara you could power Europe. You know, well, you know, sorry about Delaware and Rhode Island, but, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, at this stage, uh, it looks um, kind of manageable. Okay. So now, actually, it's worth 
an, an interesting look at, uh, at population densities and the like. And the reason for doing this is to bring to your minds the fact that energy policies might naturally be very different in different places on the planet because of how and where people live. So these are all courtesy, actually, of David Mackay, uh, who's uh, a former colleague of mine in Cambridge, but he's the chief scientist for the UK's Department of Energy and Climate Change. Um, he wrote a beautiful book called Sustainable Energy Without the Hot Air, which I recommend you look at. Uh, uh, and, and I've nicked various stuff from him here. So this is population densities plotted against population for no particular reason. And basically what you have on here is the US states um, and uh, various bits of England and Wales and Scotland, which are up here on this. And then this is Euro Europe. Okay. So, so firstly, no, population density is not surprising me very a great deal. If you come from a small cramped country like mine in England, that maps on to a population density which is like New Jersey or Rhode Island, namely the busiest places in the US. Whereas a large number of uh, Republican, sorry, whatever states they say, the voting states, uh, are up here with low population densities. And they will have different obsessions than the ones down there on energy automatically because of what comes next. Notice also that, you know, the US is, I mean, so 43 per square kilometer, this is the average population density on the planet. Most of the U.S. Is, is around there, but a lot of it is much less populated. Of course, most of Europe is more heavily populated uh, than the rest of the planet, with the exception of the Nordic countries here. Okay. So, this is one, so, so this is population density. Now, how about population density and energy use? So this is a very nice plot, which has population density, namely people per square kilometer on this axis, and then energy consumption per person on this axis. Uh, so, so what you see are there are countries with a very high energy consumption like Australia per person and a very low population density. There are countries, uh, rich countries are all up here mostly, um, uh, with exception of a few profligate countries in the Middle East. Uh, so the US is here, again a higher population density in Australia but not as high as Bahrain. Um, uh, but you know, a high use, energy use. Uh, down here are poor countries. Here is India, Pakistan. So these are countries with a very high population density, but a relatively low energy use. The average of the world is about there. Um, but, uh, but there's another number which is kind of interesting is if you just look at isobars across here, this is now, these lines are energy use per square meter. So 10 watts per square meter, 1 watt per square meter, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001. Okay. Um, so on that axis, of course, down here, there are countries with a very low population density and a very low energy use. There are some unfortunate countries on this end, like Singapore, which isn't even on the map, uh, uh, which is way up here, who's using a very high power density. Um, dense, so Europe is sort of sitting over here mostly. Um, the U.S. is up here. Here's the average of the world. There are interesting countries like Brazil, um, which is, you know, a rather, uh, interestingly, a tropical country with not a very high population density. Um, and as we'll discover at the moment, you know, what the energy policy that might make sense for Brazil is not the same as the energy policy that might make sense for the U.S., just because of where they lie on these lines. Um, uh, I'll blow that up a bit and now look at what one can get. And I'll go through some more of these numbers in, in detail in a moment. Okay. If you go to Arizona, uh, the energy flux is about 250 watts per square meter in the desert. Okay. That's way up here. Uh, on a sunny day in the UK, you are here. Um, however, the best one can do with current solar power technologies, which is concentrated solar power, so that's a... Uh, basically a steam engine, um, uh, 19th, nice 19th century technology, pretty decent, is over here. But you realize that that's already a problem for Singapore and Hong Kong. Even if they were to cover the whole of their islands uh, with, with, with uh, power stations, they're not going to satisfy their energy needs. And of course, up here you have a whole bunch of people who are clearly energy importers. 
here's South Korea. The UK sort of has a problem, but wind power is sort of getting in on here. Uh, bio crops are down here, one half a watt per square meter. But already the US is, and I said, I mean, these technologies might improve, by the way, but this is where we are now. The US is perilously close to this number. So, for example, don't believe that by planting the whole of US with, uh, um, with corn ethanol um, is going to solve the energy problem because there's not going to be much left to live. But however, for Brazil, um, it turns out that that makes a lot of sense because it's a tech, because of course it's a, uh, a country with a, uh, you know, um, with a much lower population density. It's very tropical and it has a very natural crop which has a dual use. Um, and therefore, sugarcane to, uh, uh, to fuel in Brazil makes a great deal of sense for Brazil. Um, and, you know, you can look around on here and find your favorite country. Some of the big ones, here's Bangladesh, here's India, here's China, uh, all running about these. And the interesting thing is, by the way, that all of the big energy users lie more or less in the same kind of band. We are all using power um, at the same, uh, same rate per square meter. But of course, unfortunately, many of these countries, so these bowers which come down here, are trails which go back, I think, between 1990 and 2005. And as you see, the US hasn't moved very far along this axis. China has moved a considerable way. And so has India, and so has Bangladesh. Um, and you know, the, the, so, so, that, so, the, so the rates of change matter. Okay, okay so now you decide you want uh, to convert the US to concentrated solar power. As I say, well, it only takes Rhode Island and Delaware. Well, actually not so quick, really, because I calculated that number on the basis of solar insulation, which is actually down here. Um, so this, by the way, this is data from NREL that you can go and look up. This is the, basically the average direct solar flux which would be usable. And not surprisingly, it's the desert states of the southwest that have most of this. Unfortunately, this is a strange unit. This is kilowatt hours per square meters per day. So multiply this by 24, right? Because, we, because we've got hours per day in here, right? So what you see is that this is around seven or eight up here. So this is two to 300. Uh, down here, it's one order of magnitude less. Right, so let's suppose we wanted three terawatts at 300 watts per square meter. There it is. You know, barely a pimple on Arizona. We're all happy. The only problem is that that requires us to get 100% to get efficiency in full insulation. Okay? Suppose we use the current best concentrated solar power technology, which is around 20 watts per square meter. Um, that's now really a large part of Arizona, which has gone. And by the way, of course, this is not allowing for the fact that you know, you've got to get, you know, you can't really, you know, cover the whole of the place. You know, you have to have space for the trucks to drive in and various things to come in and out. So it'll undoubtedly be more than that. If you were to use it with current generation photovoltaics, it's here. And if you were to make the mistake of moving those photovoltaics and putting them up there, it looks like this. Okay, right. Um, now, by the way, when you see things like this, you wonder what on earth is Germany thinking about when it introduces subsidies for solar power in a northern European country that isn't very sunny, right? It's quite clear that there is no way that you could ever produce any significant amount of energy that would matter for Germany that way. And of course, the answer is that they're trying to build an industrial base so that they can sell it here. Right? Because uh, indeed, economics matters. So, so a huge yes, please. Oh, sorry, you're saying that Germany's doing is a waste, basically. Well, right now they're very forward and like installing a bunch of solar. Right. Yeah. Well, so, so, so the question is, are they? Is it actually going to make a difference to the energy budget in Germany? Yeah. And the answer is no. Okay. What it is, what is, is what is actually doing? Of course, it, it is producing a solar power industry that could potentially export across the planet and increase the German trade balance. You know, that, that's the, I mean, I, no, I don't think the German politicians are dumb, right? So they, they know how to do these sums any bit that I do. Well, no, I mean, I think it's, you would call it mercantilist economic policy. Maybe. 
I don't know. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, do we have data on uh, what percent of the uh, solar pa panels installed in Germany are made in Germany? Because I certainly. Oh, there you go. Indeed. And by, by, by the way, the, the, answer is, the answer is that even if you might have thought that that was going to be their economic policy, it has failed. Uh, the solar panels are all made in China like everybody else's. But nonetheless, you know, the, the, uh, you know, one needs to be very careful. I mean, uh, policy depends on geography. Um, and so for a country like Germany, for example, to decide it doesn't want nuclear power means that it is committed to importing energy, gas from Russia, and nuclear-based electricity from France. You know, whether or not they honestly, I mean, they, 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 whether or anybody will admit they've made that decision, that's the decision that they've made, is that they have, they have defined themselves as an energy importer, maybe a technology exporter. But, but, it, but so, uh, um, and by the way, you know, one, one can do these kind of analyses for lots of things, actually. So the first thing, anyway, I'm going to say, like this, this is an old Far Side cartoon. Um, as I say, you come to this thinking that this is all about technology and about technology inventions and all of these things. And the answer is, of course, that, if, that, that whatever we're going to do, any deployments have to be on a massive scale. And so the real issue is money. Um, the issue is not just having a good technology, but having a technology that can be delivered sustainably at low cost, and there's all kinds of other costs that we'll come to. So, you know, so, so firstly, you know, renewables will need country-sized deployment. Um, because, as I'll point out, the most available and most straightforward renewable source is, at the moment, solar, even though it's not easy. And so there's going to be a huge premium on efficiency, because notice the big difference between what happens if you've got 5 watts per square meter and 20 watts per square meter makes an enormous amount of difference, and it depends on geography. Right? The, uh, so, so a technology which is useful here may not be important somewhere else. Now, we we'll ask questions actually about wind, hydro, and wave, and I'm going to come back to bits of thermodynamics. So wind energy. Okay, so here's a nice picture of a, something in the North Sea. If you want to go out and buy, uh, actually not one of these, something which is actually considerably bigger, the largest available on the market is an Enercon E126. 126 for sounds for 126 meters of wingspan, diameter. Uh, it will deliver, when fully operating, 7.58 megawatts. It weighs 6,000 tons. Okay. Uh, so how much energy can you get out of one of these? Well, actually, if you want a wind farm, it turns out that the standard operating protocol is you can't put them too close together because one shadows the other. And you can work this out, actually, for fluid dynamics, Navier-Stokes. Turns out that the best spacing is about six to ten times the rotor diameter. So that means that if you have a really big one like this, then the radius of separation is about 360 meters. So that's the area per rotor. This is the power per unit area. And that works out, actually, at full operations, giving you 18 watts per square meter. In practice, even in a windy place, you get these things on 35% of the time. This is a very good rate of doing that. So this will give you about 6 watts per square meter. Okay. Um, it's interestingly close to the solar numbers. And, of course, there's a very good reason for that because the energy comes in as sunlight and it gets absorbed and gets translated into other things. And one of the things you learn as a physicist is equipartition. You know, this is kinetic energy of winds in the atmosphere and it's driven by the solar flux. And that all other things being equal, there's a virial theorem which will convert one into the other. And, of course, you can get more energy out of these things by building them higher and higher, but if you take them up to the top of the atmosphere, it turns out the amount of energy available is very comparable to some fraction of the solar flux on the basis of very good physical principles. But it's not negligible. Um, now, one you might like is hydro. Hydro, in principle, is very interesting because one of the difficulties with... Most renewables is that they really are diffuse. The real problem is that you've got to collect it everywhere at this low power density. The nice thing about hydro is that valleys do that for you. There's some geography which has happened. And so, in principle, you know, and what, it, what is it? It's gravitational energy from rainfall. That's what you're collecting. So how much is there and how much do we get back, right? So I don't know these numbers very well, but I'm guessing the annual rainfall in Colorado so I can work out the mass 
I now know the energy stored, and therefore the average an annual average power per unit area from rainfall in Colorado is actually disappointingly small. Right. Worse than that, we don't get very much of it out through the Hoover Dam. Now, of course, the Hoover Dam is not draining all of Colorado, but it's draining some of Colorado and some of other states. So if I work out how much I'm getting per square kilometer in Colorado, so there's the area of Colorado. So the power generated per unit area of Colorado by the Hoover Dam is actually 1.5 milliwatts per square meter. Okay. So I have to say that that's, an, that that's an unfortunately small number because it will be, um, uh, you know, it would be nice if we could get more energy this way because it comes out as a point source, which is the way that we want it, whereas everything else is there. Um, uh, and you might ask, well, actually, how much energy cost goes into these things? And I'll come back to energy costs in a moment. So if you look at all of these numbers, the basic problem is that renewable sources are actually diffuse, and if we want to get energy out of them, we have to be prepared to deploy on absolutely massive scales. These are, you know, pretty much the best numbers that we have now. And, of course, there is some way of moving it up. Uh, so solar power is here, solar photovoltaic is here, Biomass is languishing very far behind. Um, and actually, one can put that in context. There's a nice, um, you, know, you know, one, no, so, so, uh, so question is, you know, suppose you thought that you would power the vehicles on the highway by planting switchgrass on the side, on the verge of the highway, harvesting the grass and using it to power the fuel in the car, okay? So the question is, for a typical highway, how wide a verge do you need to do that? And the answer is about eight kilometers. Okay, right? Uh, so, uh, so, I mean, I, mean I, I have a particular worry about biomass at the moment because actually we're getting to the stage where it is commercially successful. So it's possible to make money out of it. However, it's not possible to make a dent in the energy supply with it. Uh, so the effect of going to more biomass may be the price, maybe mostly on the price of tortillas. Right. So, so, but I mean, but, but nonetheless, there's no reason, of course, in principle. And if you were Nate Lewis, who I hope you should get to come along to speak to some of these things, Nate would say that there is some hope that eventually, you know, we will get this thing up to these kind of numbers. And of course, the advantage of biomass that, in principle, you know, you can do it with agriculture, right? There are established methods for getting the stuff out of the ground if plants grow. But plants are appallingly inefficient. They're at the sub-1% level uh, in doing this. Um, th this, is a, this is, of course, an odd one because this is tidal. I've included this one here. This is, of course, not solar-powered. This is moon-powered. Um, uh, but places where tidal is available, um, uh, which are rather specialized, um, it's often something of a player. It has almost no relevance in the United States. Uh, but if you go to Northern Europe, there's one heck of a tidal flow that flows around the UK at various times of the year. Uh, and harvesting that is worthwhile. And as I say, the problem with highland rainwater is that this number turns out to be very much. Okay. Um, and so... But the other side of all of this is that this is the power density about what you get out. We're talking about it, assume that there's no energy cost of what went in. And that's the next problem we, we, we should think about energy to construct. So I want to talk about the energy cost of making things. And I want to begin with something which I think is known in economic circles, I believe, as the hamburger rule. Okay. Um, and you know, suppose you have something very complicated and you want to estimate how much it costs. You know, a car, a ship, something awkward. It turns out there's a very good rule of thumb, and that's the hamburger rule. Uh, so ground beef is ten, around ten dollars a kilo. Uh, here's a Honda Civic. Uh, well, a Honda Civic, its price is sixteen thousand dollars. Its weight is one thousand two hundred kilograms, and actually that works out to be thirteen dollars a kilo. So this is, the, and actually this is a very good rule of thumb for estimating sort of fairly complicated things, right? The, the, the weigh it and multiply by the price of hamburger. And actually, it's very interesting to note the cases where it fails. 
It used to work in battleships up until about 1970, and then they escalated out of sight. Uh, but, but, uh, so, but, I mean, a lot of this is, is really has a very simple consequence, because the cost of things these days is mostly their energy input. Um, making a kilo of steel, one-third of the cost of steel is the energy input. Uh, for aluminum, it's about half, okay? Um, and so, you know, we, we can do a sort of backwards calculation and say, you know, let's just sort of assume, you know, what will be the cost of energy needed to make that stuff based on knowing how much energy, this is thermodynamics, it actually costs to make it and this is the price, and there's an implied cost of energy. So it turns out, you know, for steel it's, it's, it's 13 cents and for a uh, kilo of aluminum it's 15 cents. And for hamburger it comes out about the same number, providing I remember that I should allow for the inefficiency of turning uh, food into cow. Uh, which, according to David Pimontel and various others, is around about a factor of 50, and that then works out to be about 11 cents. This, of course, you know, this is a liter of diesel. Kilo of wheat flour is a slightly higher. I've not allowed for any inefficiencies in the energy presumption here. You know, this is, uh, look this up on Weight Watchers to get this number. This is the amount that you get out, and I assume that was the number that went into it, and it's pretty much clear, okay? Now, um, I don't know what the cost of energy is around here. I mean, I paid 10 cents uh, a kilowatt hour in Illinois, uh, which actually has really low energy prices for a bizarre reason, that they built uh, too many power stations and it's really poorly connected to the rest of the country, so they can't get it out. Uh, um, problem with energy policy. But the, but the point about all of these things is that these are not then actually very different from the real cost of energy. Of course, if you run an aluminum smelter, you're probably only paying five cents a kilowatt hour, so some of this is more than that. But you see by looking at all of these things that actually a very large part of the cost of everyday things is the cost of the energy that went into them, and that is growing. Uh, so that's a very important, and actually I will argue is kind of a useful principle. Now you can turn this on its head, you can Rather than working out the energy, because so here's my E126 wind turbine, uh, it's actually difficult to figure out exactly how much they cost, but if you go to the Bloomberg Finance Wind Turbine Price Index, they'll give you an estimated cost of 10 million for one of these things. So the question you can really ask is, what's the time to break even at 10 cents a kilowatt hour? And it's about three and a half years, and it's not surprising. And if you do that, by the way, for a solar panel at a dollar a watt, you get four years also. Again, the broad message here is that energy is money. Um, uh, and so that sort of brings me to this graph, which can be interpreted in all kinds of ways. So this is what, uh, this is a, you know, venture capitalist trying to convince you that now is the time to invest in solar. Okay. And so this, you probably can't read it from the back, this goes from 2000 to 2007. And what this is talking about, the blue bar here, is the US government investment in R&D, the green thing which is turning up is venture capital investment um, and the red bar is solar public equity activity. So this is people spending money on installing solar. Okay? So one way of looking at this curve is to say, aha, the government has helped us out. They've been investing for many years actually in solar energy technologies. Finally, the technology matured in about 2004 and you got a wave of uh, private capital investment to bring it out. Now, that may be one interpretation, but there's a number of problems with that. The first one is that the technologies that are being introduced here were invented in the 1980s. There is very little new technology associated of the kind that money was being spent on here, which is appearing there. And probably the most likely thing that produces this is the oil price, right? So if you look at the oil price, the oil price is hovering around $20, $40. Um, once you get to this point, and all of a sudden, the venture capitalists become convinced that oil is going to go above some break-even point. Absolutely, quite naturally, there will be a massive investment. This has nothing to do with technology development, with science, with a sort of a rather depressing uh, uh, conclusion in some ways. And of course, the danger about this is that if this number comes down again, and by the way, it has in the past, so just turn off. Um, so we're, uh, we're actually in a very odd situation 
of having our technology policy influenced by one darn thing, which is actually the price of oil. Um, so that's a bit of a... Well, maybe. So, so indeed, so, so the, the... Look, by the way, it's quite clear, if you like, that you can find some interesting foreign policy excursions here which raise the price of oil. And I don't know whether they were done for that reason, but, but uh, you know, but, but, but they, no, they, they've had... They, they've had... No, uh, they, they've had effects. So, so one cannot avoid the externalities and how this all develops. And, of course, it's a real challenge if you're a technologist trying to develop new technologies. Because whether or not you get money has nothing to do with whether your technology is better than somebody else. It's a question about whether you're going to get put out of business next year by um, you know, oil sands or shale gas or something else which is going to turn up on this curve and, and knock it over. Please. Too much about this, but uh, is there? Do you think there's more investment going into solar versus like other renewable energies, like wind and geothermal and whatnot? Actually, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, I, I think the un the answer is that they all turn out they all turn up to be getting a substantial amount of of investment at roughly the same time. So the so there so, the, so for example, there is a lot of investment in wind, yeah. right? Um, and wind has actually, over a long period, has a, had a great down. And of course, the, the wind investments began in Europe because Europe has higher oil prices. And also, it happens to be windy, and there's this nice flat sea that you can put wind turbines in, and not so many people who care about ducks as there are in, 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 in New England. Uh, so, so actually, so wind has been developed um, substantially more in the last few years in Europe. But fundamentally, you know, if you, if I think, I mean, I, I haven't done it, but I suspect if you look at a similar analysis, you'll see a similar curve like this. And probably the correlation is actually with the competing technology, which is the oil price. Um, and of course, again, if you're Germany, one of the arguments that what you're trying to do is you're trying to tweak these takeoff points by changing the oil price. So the fact that the oil price is a factor of two higher you know, so energy costs are a factor of two higher somewhere else, means that they'll get a technology takeoff which is earlier because it makes more sense for people to put their venture capital here rather than in California. And of course, California is playing this game with regard to other states in the US by cranking up its, uh, uh, its, its policy goals to make these turn-on points occur earlier. And you could argue that that's a, va that's a valid... Uh, you know, policy thing to do. And I said I wasn't going to talk about policy because it's much too complicated, especially for somebody like me. But it's quite clear that it matters. If you start thinking about how all of these things work together, it, it, it's clear that, that it, it's sort of uh, uh, unavoidable. So, so let me go, go back to a recap. Um, um, oh, gee, I'm talking much too long. When did I start? So, yeah, so, so, um, so first thing is, you know, back to the physics. Equipartition. It turns out that the atmosphere is very well mixed, so the energy comes in in solar and it gets smushed out in everything else, and they all have about the same amount. And that's a problem because that means that the power densities are all very similar and they're all rather low. Of course, it does mean that we should use them all. Right? I mean, they're independent. There's no reason you can't have solar and wind and hydro. And in fact, there are clearly going to be balances to doing those things. The other one, of course, is now that the payback time for the energy used in the construction is already a substantial fraction of the lifetime, and that is a natural state of affairs. You know, um, uh, so energy is really money. Um, and you know, I'd like to call this really, I think this is actually an example of second law of thermodynamics applied to economics. Okay. Because you know, one of my real contentions here is that, in fact, this is good. Because we've got to a situation where we have monetized energy and we will never again make it cheap. And as a result of never again being able to make it cheap, that means that, there is a, that we now actually have the financial conditions in place that we can make a transition to a sustainable energy. It's only because we ran out of the other stuff or ran out of it enough that the price pressure is such that we're not competing with something that's free. Okay. Uh, so, so actually what that means is that money is really energy and that without realizing it, we have moved back onto not the gold standard, 
but to something where actually the value of your dollar is really tied to the price of energy. And it strikes me, by the way, that if we were to go back on the energy standard, that would simplify one heck of a lot the economics and to turn the whole business around in such a way as you could actually begin to make rational, sustainable decisions because we now understand what the biggest cost of anything is. It's energy, so energy has become money. We, of course, won't do that for all kinds of uh, good political reasons, but it may sort of have happened anyway. Um, so now let me turn quickly to technology, and I realize I, I, I don't have very long. And I'm, so, uh, you, know, you know, a few issues and a few bullets, and then I'll talk about one thing. Okay. So I said, you know, sources are going to be country-sized. Okay. Uses, however, are point source, and that's another problem. Um, so, uh, you know, people use energy. People all decide to live in cities. Now, maybe they won't in the future. If we had a truly sustainable energy technology, maybe we would disperse back in the countryside and use energy at the point where we were collecting it. But at the moment, however, we have to ship our energy to places where we all are, um, and shipping that energy around is, a, of course, by itself a big issue. Another one that I'll just point out, and again, this is obvious, less important here, but enormously important if you say you live in Africa, um, remember that if you don't have a power grid, the moment you have photovoltaics and storage, you're sort of comfortable, particularly if you now add efficient refrigeration because that gives you food storage and vaccination. And if you've traveled to many parts of the world, you will know that um, uh, you know, every day, somebody in the family will walk five or 10 miles to the nearest village to get food to cook that evening. If you actually have a refrigerator, you don't need to do that. And by the way, you can vaccinate your kids. And furthermore, if you've got lighting, they can read at night, and you're now connected to the web, so you have, so you have education. Okay. So these sets of technologies are spectacularly world-changing when used in concert, uh, but not in California, um, in India, in Asia, in Africa, uh, in, in all kinds of places. And by the way, this is going to push sets of technology development that will happen there that are probably very different from here. Because it matters more. Right. If you don't have anything to compete with, and the choice is having energy or no energy, you're actually prepared to pay more for it. Okay. So, question about how much headroom. And, I, and, I, and, and this gets some sense of the stuff that I do for a living. Um, now, I'd like to argue that, in fact, particularly on these, there are, there are a number of key transformative, you could even call them miracle technologies, which if we actually need, got at 100% efficiency, it really would change the planet. They're all electrically based. We need PV for generation, we need bas batteries for storage, we need something for refrigeration, and we need uh, better lighting. And about the only one that we're anywhere close to having good is LEDs for electrical lighting. And the reason for that is this is a remarkably simple technology because it's a point source, it's a use. It's the inverse of a photovoltaic because one takes, a, takes light energy in and produces electricity, the other takes electricity in and produces light, and they basically are the inverse of each other. But of course, if, all you want, if you have the energy provided at a point source and you just want to make, make a point source, that's a lot easier than building a thousand square kilometers of the stuff. Um, uh, let me move on a bit. I'll talk a bit about batteries because uh, I think that is uh, kind of a useful thing and by the way, you might be able to buy one soon. Okay. Um, what is the state of automotive technologies with batteries? So this is a plug for Argon technology and I'll explain why in a moment. This is the Chevy Volt. You can go and buy one. Um, uh, and in that, there is this battery and as you can see, it's quite large. In fact, it weighs 200 kilos. The raw cost of it actually is $8,000, and that's $500 per kilowatt hour. And by the way, it will get you 40 miles on the battery only. So we're very proud of this. Um, it's clearly not going to revolutionize automotive technology quite yet. Um, but let's look about how much better it might be able to get. Okay. Um, so this is where battery technologies look in useful numbers. 
Basically, this is energy, namely watt hours per liter, energy per unit volume, and this is energy per unit mass. A lead acid battery is down here. Um, things you're familiar with, nickel cadmium is here, nickel metal hydride is here, so-called lithium ion batteries. These are the things that you have in your laptop. They're based on lithium cobalt oxide. And that technology, which is called Argonne National Labs Composite Oxide Technology, that are, is there. Okay, so it's actually better. Okay. Um, where is gasoline? Well, gasoline is, is 12,000 watt hours per liter, so it's over there. Okay. It's about a factor of 60 by weight uh, worse than gasoline. Okay. Is there a possibility that we could get closer to that? Um, and so you could ask, well, what's the fundamental limit? So, <clears throat> again, let's go back to the numbers. It's nice, actually, to measure energy densities in sensible units. My favorite is electron volts per cubic angstrom. You know, because that's a, no, that's a sensible solid-state physics number. That's the units that things come in. Okay. Uh, so, actually, that's 1.6 times 10 to the 11 joules per cubic meter, or that's 160 megajoules per liter. Um, the lithium-ion battery that you have in your laptop is down here. It's 0.75. Uh, diesel is 38. Um, liquid hydrogen is 10. Um, uh, and, and so now, well, you know, so th there's, there's a substantial gap. Is there a... Yes, okay, okay. Is there, By the weight, if you don't mind towing a balloon behind your car, this is per liter. This, so, so if you want to have a hydrogen-powered vehicle, it'll be sort of interestingly shaped. This is liquid. No, oh, this, is, this is liquid hydrogen. So, so if you just want compressed gases, um, hydrogen is far from an obvious choice as a fuel. Uh, it occupies a lot of space. Um, it's difficult to liquefy. It's difficult for all kinds of reasons. You know, and there's no, and by the way, there's no established uh, delivery technology. I mean, actually, the prediction is that what will be next in your car is probably shale gas, unfortunately. Okay. Now, actually, let me just... So, it was, so, so, the, right, so the answer, by the way, why is the energy density of this so, so bad, right? And the real problem is, although it's called a lithium ion, what are the other ions in there? Well, actually, it's cobalt. Right. And that's kind of an inert thing which is there necessary for it to actually work. Right. So it's providing a framework which allows you to do the uh, uh, reduction reactions that you need. And cobalt is very heavy. So, in fact, the aims on the... Well, in fact, I may show you some of that in a moment. The, 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 the technology aim is to reduce the amount of heavy transition metals and replace them by more lithium. Right. So, for example, if you just set fire to lithium, that's called a lithium air battery. At the moment, it only goes one way because you can set fire to lithium. We don't know how to go back. That's a big number. That's much bigger than any of these. Right. Okay. Uh, so, but, but actually, I, you know, I, I want to fantasize a moment and introduce some of my own science for the right way of doing this. You know, why move ions around at all? Why not just make a fancy kind of capacitor? And I will point out that we already have one that, that in principle works very nicely. Uh, Harold Wang, who lives down the bay at Stanford, um, made a nice breakthrough recently by growing materials of oxides, which look like this and their alloys of strontium titanate and lanthanum aluminate. These things look boring because this is an insulator and that's an insulator. However, if you join them up in this particular way, what you actually notice is that strontium and titanium are 2 plus, lanthanum and aluminum are 3 plus, and at the point where you join them up here, there is a layer of charge, excess charge, which is associated with that misbalance. Okay? Of course, if you grow it a bit thicker and you grow the strontium titanate back in, there will be compensating charge, which appears on the other, but you've built a bilayer capacitor and it looks like this. Uh, and so, you know, there's fixed charge, negative on one surface, positive on another surface. Okay? So, but it's still boring. But of course, because of a capacitor has the effect of producing an electric field which is perpendicular to the surface of the charge, 
that means that there is a voltage which grows with distance, linearly with distance, away from the charged interface. So this grows and grows and grows, and then, of course, it reaches the other interface and it comes back down. If, in going from there to there, this voltage exceeds the band gap, then you get free charge, which moves to this surface. And by the way, that free charge is then completely tunable, because if I put an external bias on this circuit, I can change the amount of free charge that I get in and out. Okay. Uh, so this is actually an ultracapacitor, but it's actually more than an ultracapacitor because the internal electric fields are, are completely compensated, and therefore it won't blow up. It's quite stable. Uh, uh, actually, in principle, the density of this can be quite high, and furthermore, it's an intrinsic photovoltaic, because if I shine light on this intervening region, I create electrons and holes. The electrons go one way, the holes go the other, because the fields are the same. And so actually, this is a photovoltaic that automatically does the storage, so you paint this on your car roof and you're done. Okay? Uh, you, know, you will understand, actually, that there are some problems at the moment. Firstly, this is grown by MBE-like techniques, so it's not very cheap. Uh, actually, it doesn't work as advertised because there's problems with defects and reconstructed surfaces. So currently, this is a fictional and extremely expensive device. Nonetheless, uh, there are no principles that would prevent something like that from being invented. I don't know whether it's going to be done with lanthanum strontium oxide or in some bacteria, right? Because these, of course, the, pr the principles that photosynthesis uses to separate charge as well. And by the way, you know, the, you know, very sensible numbers, uh, you can get up to the storage density of gasoline in something which is really compact and very light. Okay? Uh, no, I mean, of course, it's completely fictional. Um, you know, I say we've solved it at some level. I mean, the, 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 uh, but, 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 it, but the point is, it, you know, it is important to have outliers like that that give you hope, that say, this isn't crazy. I don't think I'd want to do it this way, probably. Uh, but it's doable. Okay. Now, the problem, by the way, with current batteries is that they don't look anywhere like that idealized system. They look like this. So if you break up in a battery, it's sort of broken up into bits, and this is the cathode, this is the anode. If you look in more detail, it's sort of lumps of stuff. Uh, and, you know, there's things in there that you put in there deliberately. There's things in there that you didn't put in there deliberately but happen to be there anyway. There's chemistry that goes on while the battery happens. It's, it's two orders of magnitude with the affordable optimal performance. It's very complicated. It's deeply complicated because it's been designed from the top down. And actually, it depends on stuff that we haven't invented either as well. So you know, what would you like? You'd like a technology path that looked like this. Okay, here's Moore's Law. Um, and the point about Moore's Law, by the way, is not so much the fact that this is on a log scale, but that it's predictable. So, you know, building a factory for, uh, you know, for four gigabit memory, you know, will cost you a few billion dollars. However, you can borrow a few billion dollars if you can explain to your banker that, you know, here's the curve, and I'm going up there, and I know what I can sell it for, and I know what the market is, and I know how to make it, and I know all of those things, okay? So what does our technology path look like for batteries? Okay, so this is the thing that you have in your laptop. This is the stuff that we're just putting in, and this we know how to build. Um, and when we're getting up to here, by the way, this is, a material, this is an anode material which is called Li2MX04. What's the element X, you say? Well, the answer is I don't know. Uh, this is some transition metal which is different from the one which is there. But we believe if we do that, we can get on this. And by 2017, we're supposed to have invented that and put it in. Uh, by 2019, we have this interesting material called UNKHVHC, and that stands for unknown high voltage, high capacity cathode. <laughs> right? This is completely hopeless, actually. How can you go to a bank and borrow money to build a factory to build something you haven't quite invented yet? And it's sort of the, 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 would you lend me money to do this? And the challenge here, of course, is that as you go through these material science technologies, the chemistry changes at each point. This material is different from that, is different from that. Each one requires a breakthrough, a new set of discoveries, a new set of technology. It's not like silicon at all, which is on some kind of path where you're tweaking it as you go through here. 
And one of the difficulties that we have with energy technologies for materials is that they're all like this. They all involve unspecified breakthroughs to be made at some point in the future that will require uh, massive invention. And of course, when you look at this, what you realize you actually need is a bit more science. We'd actually like to be able to do this a bit more systematically. And of course, to get you back onto science, here's my Bob Laughlin view graph. So David and, and knows this very well. So, okay. By the way, you know, we, we of course do understand all of this because it's all in here. This is the Schrodinger equation. It is for these purposes the theory of everything. Well, there should be some relativistic corrections, but that doesn't matter too much. And of course, this equation describes everything around you. It describes air, water, fire, rocks, cement, steel, plastic, glass, wood, asphalt, paper, dynamite, antifreeze, glue, dyes, vitamins, ham sandwiches, Ebola virus, and economists. They're all described by this equation. Right? So the, the, uh, um, and, uh, and, and a lot of our challenges are to find a way of systematizing and building models and building understanding so that we really can understand these things properly. But of course, we're not going to solve these properly by solving the Schrodinger equation. We may get some bits of it that way. Okay. So, um, so I, I, I should close, actually. But, but so where I am on this, the first problem, and I, by the way, I don't have answers. Okay? You know, we first, we desperately need to develop a roadmap for materials technologies that gets us out of these absolutely primitive 19th century technologies into something that's actually modern. Right? Um, you know, we are very far away from where we want to do, and that's the science challenge of the next few decades. The other point I will point out is that top-down engineering is not the solution. You might think that building a new battery electrode for the Chevy Volt will be the right thing to do. What I will point out is that two-thirds of the weight in that plug-in hybrid electric vehicle battery is what's called packaging. It's not the chemistry. It's not those bits. It's the control electronics. It's the safety engineering so it doesn't blow up. It's the casing so that it'll still be there in a crash. Um, similarly, if you look at the cost of a solar panel installation, it is not the module. If the modules were free, it would still cost you a fortune to put one on the roof because you have to pay for the power electronics and the packaging. The installation costs, you will have to pay permit fees because every single city will require that, unlike a television which you can plug in, if you want to have a solar panel installation on your roof, it has to be inspected by a qualified inspector. And, and so there's all kinds of stuff that come with costs in here. Uh, which exceed the cost of the technology. And in fact, we've already discovered that with solar. Solar might as well be free. I mean, so the solar module is, is uh, the, the cost of that, despite having it driven it down below $1 per watt, it still costs a lot to put one up. And the reason is all of the other stuff. Okay. What it means is that the technology is completely wrong. You do not want to have a technology which in the end has to have wires and wiring and plumbing and plugs and all kinds of stuff you know, something which is inherently simpler. And we have to find ways of, you know, making functional materials where we define the properties precisely controlled by interfaces on the nanoscale. And then we manufacture it at low cost and enormous volume. And we install it not like electronics, but like carpet. Right. So, uh, uh, so I don't know whether a nanotechnology of the fab in the future is going to look like that or like that, or maybe like that. Okay. Uh, but somewhere between all of these things is where we will have to find our way. And as I say, I don't have a solution for all of this. I provided you with uh, uh, lots of questions. You know, here's my final remark. On the science, I have modest optimism. Okay? There's enough energy around. There's plenty of space for new technology. We can make this work, and the problems are containable. Okay? The economics, I think, are in balance because on one side, the amount of money which will have to be expended is enormous, uh, but you know, it's only you know, trillions, um, and we can do that if we would need. And also the point is now, I think, that we've got to the stage where energy itself is expensive enough that this now matters. And a lot about what happens in the next few years will in fact depend on whether the price of energy is actually high enough that new technologies aren't simply strangled at birth. And then the last one, actually, is, I think, a matter of geopolitics that I haven't discussed, where I think the answer is questionable. 
And as I pointed out briefly, those countries with the greatest embedded capacity, namely those countries with a power grid, with natural gas, with roads and oil, will be the slowest to innovate. The most likely innovators are India, China, Brazil, Africa. I'm not quite sure how they will do it. Uh, but they care more about this than we do. Um, and no, uh, there, there's, a, no, there's a sort of an, an interesting aspect to understand how the economics and the science will play out, for example, in countries like India and China, which have a very strong science base and a growing technology base, and they care much more about these problems than we do. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll stop and apologize for keeping you so long. Thanks. questions until nine. Uh, there will be opportunities for those of you who are faculty members. You're invited to join Peter for a little wine and cheese and discussion in room 14, uh, 4440 Chem Annex, which is nearby. Those of you who are students are invited to join our class tomorrow morning at 8.30 from 8.30 to 10, Peter will be with us. Then I think he's going to... that's in the same room, 4440 Canada. Same place. Uh, then I think he may have time to spend time with Steve Hartzog's class mm -hmm. uh, from 10 until about 11. 11, that's about the time I need to leave. So. Yeah, from about 10 to 11. Mm -hmm. And that, Steve, your location is... 208 Cruz Hall. C-R-U-E-S-S, -S. Crucial. It's on the north side. So, time for two or three further questions. Yes. I just have a quick comment on the last point about your fault is questionable. Um, there is another thing that might, in this country, be a barrier against uh, some of these things, and that is, you mentioned natural gas and oil, and then you mentioned coal. Yeah, no, I mean, so the, the uh, uh, indeed, so we have a lot of coal, um, and I mean, I think, you know, the, the um, I mean, I'm slightly more worried about natural gas, partly because I'm thinking about vehicular, vehicular technologies, and the easiest thing that would displace uh, an electric-powered vehicle is a, you know, uh, is a tank of natural gas in your, in your trunk. Yeah, electric power is going to be essentially burning coal. Right, indeed. So, so, okay, so now there's, there's an interesting story, of course, about what happens when you displace technologies. Uh, so, um, you know, it isn't always advantageous, for example, to introduce wind power because you have to understand what technology would you be using when there isn't any wind to balance the demand. Uh, and so if the choice is using wind power with a coal power station as backup, or using natural gas, you're probably better to go off with natural gas. And so there's been an interesting issue in China it's precisely associated with that, because China has vast numbers of, of coal power stations that they are using to back up wind power, and the effect on, and the effect on uh, CO2 is actually negative from doing that. Yes. So, so, and you're right that if that it, I mean, all I, all I was talking about, you know, I want an electric vehicle. If all I'm doing is using an electric vehicle to burn coal, that's even worse than running it on gasoline. Uh, so that's why we need to solve the problems together. We can't do it separately. I think that's a really good point. I'm surprised that you're talking about the huge effect of the fluctuation of oil price on. Um, on the energy sources, but uh, you don't talk about nuclear at all. No, I mean, I'd be happy to talk about nuclear too, I just didn't have time. Yeah. Uh, so, but I mean, so, so nu nuclear has interesting and special problems, right? Its biggest problems are economic. The cost of building a nuclear power station is of the order of 10 billion. It will take 10 to 12 years before it produces any power. The payoff time is a decade farther than that. It's very difficult to persuade anybody to invest that amount of money 
with uh, not knowing what the oil price is going to be in 20 years' time. So the, you know, there might well be a solution, which is small modular reactors, but small modular reactors produce this proliferation problem, so people don't want to touch them either. So, I mean, do, you, do you want to make another comment? Or are, are you... Well, I think the biggest problem is with nuclear is psychological, you know, not economic, because Korea already won over General Electric, right? For well, reactors in India. No, but, no but, but, by the, but by the way, if you go back to my earlier curves, you understand that, rene that, that renewables are simply out of the question for, for Korea. It's on the wrong side of any of those lines. It's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's too far north. It has too high a population density, and they use too much energy. They have no choice. And by the way, you know, I mean, there, there's no, I mean, yeah, there's psychological problem. But you know, people are building nuclear power plants in France. They're building them in the UK. They're building them in Korea. In the US, actually, we're building nuclear power plants, but very slowly. And you know, what I'm told, and I may be wrong, is that the principal problem with those is not entirely the you know, people worried about nuclear power. It's just raising the money to do it. Because it takes too long, too much time, too much capital investment against an uncertain energy market. How do you know that somebody isn't going to you know, you know, do something with coal and drive the price of energy down to something which is very low? And, and you're completely lost. And I mean, there are other issues about, you know, what do you do with waste and things like that. But I think that the, one of the principal problems is just raising the capital. Nuclear plants are too big. Small ones would be much better. You know, everybody should have a little one. No, but I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, so small modular reactors would be a very sensible thing to do because they could be mass produced you know, they, 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 their, their community size, their sort of kind of drop in. Um, and it's very difficult to understand why we're not pursuing that as an energy technology. Um. Yeah, it's being pursued by private companies uh, and it's counted for their not US market. Well, yeah, I mean, so, the, I mean, so, so, so they, the, they're beginning. And the point is, small modular reactors make sense because the capital investment is much lower. But nonetheless, it would probably still require <coughs> actual development to be driven first by, uh, by government investment, you know, because the first one costs 10 billion, the second one costs 5 billion, the third one costs 1 billion, and then by the time you've built a lot of them, you're down to a few hundred billion a pop, which is, uh, you know, cheap for these things. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it, 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 a lot of it is kind of marginal economic costs. And, of course, the other thing is that there is a problem that we don't actually know how to build nuclear reactors anymore. We forgot. Um, so, so the... Uh, um, but, but, uh, but, you know, but it, indeed it's a... But, you know, I mean, the... Well, I mean, with nuclear, the U.S. is, of course, a policy wasteland. Partly because, I mean, the, it, you know, it won't really get touched at any kind of high level. Uh, it's one of the sort of lightning rods of things. But, it, but, but um, no, it's, 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 sorry. Too long an answer to that. Let me, before we close, make one announcement. Uh, next week, our distinguished lecturer will be uh, Simon Levin of Princeton. He's arguably one of the two or three world's leading ecologists. He will address pretty much the same topic that Peter has, and we'll hear another perspective, I think, it will not be all that different, but it will be fascinating to find out. So I encourage you to come again next Thursday at uh, 7.30, same location, uh, same great sponsorship of these distinguished lecturers by our provost and our dean. Thank you all very much for coming. Join me in thanking Peter once more. Second, one of the audience said, is there anything that you two could agree on? <laughs> and we looked at each other, and after a while we both came up with the statement actually that 
it's clear that at least one of us is wrong. <laughs> and that, that's, that's where we, we, we've been for a long time. But, uh, but I say that the, 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 the point about doing science, of course, is that you do spend a lot of time um, in an essentially adversarial point of view. And it's particularly difficult when you come to subjects like sustainability, where the necessities of science that you actually expose ideas and thoughts and data to great scrutiny also sp spill into the political arena, where those kinds of disagreements are very easily misused. And also people come uh, with a viewpoint uh, about the subject which is not born out of data or out of science, uh, but, out of, uh, but out of prejudice. So, I mean, the purpose of my talk is, is, is to ask questions. Um, and, no, this is the obvious question to ask when you come to sustainability. Um, and, you know, and I take the attitude, actually, that it isn't going to be much point in trying to get a sustainable society if it involves reducing us to the Stone Age. People won't do that. And I also think that we need to be in a situation where we assume that the status quo will be that the rest of the planet will have a standard of living which is at least as good as ours. Um, uh, and, the, no, and then, of course, the question, since I use physics in the title, what on earth does physics have to do with that? Um, and physics, for the purpose of this talk, is in fact really a way of thinking. Um, it's a way of insisting on focusing on the data, insisting on focusing on models. Um, and by the way, I hope you'll interrupt and complain. Okay. Now, so the first thing about sustainability is that everybody is optimistic. Um, you know, if I'm going to need to find a way of walking around here so I don't trip over this, this is better, so I can see what I'm talking about. Um, so there's a recent poll um, reported on the BBC, but it was a globe-scanned poll, which means that somehow they did a global poll of what's going on, and this is, this is the optimistic view of the public. Okay. Um, a sort of Panglossian uh, statement, but this apparently is what our colleagues believe. Okay. Um, uh, even banks actually are optimistic about this. So this one I really like. I mean, I, I gave a talk recently in Scotland, and you, and you probably know HSBC has these really annoying adverts when you're exiting the plane. So uh, I'm very pleased to be introducing Peter Littlewood, who is a longtime friend, adversary on matters theoretical. <laughs> uh, a colleague, a marvelous colleague in every other way, and a great good friend. <laughs> uh, Peter did his undergraduate work at Cambridge, had a year at MIT. He told me that he didn't stay on at MIT because the person with whom he worked, Bruce Patton, didn't get tenure. That sent him back to Cambridge, where he worked with a wonderful theoretical physicist named Volker Heine. Peter said he was uh, an absolute marvelous kind of mentor. He saw Peter about once a year. <laughs> uh, Peter got his PhD, then went to Bell Labs, where he was first a postdoc and then stayed on as a member of the staff for some 19 years. Cambridge attracted him back to the Cavendish, where he was a professor, then head of the department, and uh, he realized sometime in the last year or two that uh, he could no longer make a difference at Cambridge. I can say to you that while he was there in his years at Cambridge, roughly what, about again, about two decades, one, one and a half. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. Right. He did make a difference then. He realized he could no longer make a difference at Cambridge. He got a marvelous offer from Argonne to be the associate director with major responsibility for basic science and, as you will hear, the physics of sustainability. Peter Littlewood. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, David. That, that's very kind. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and a number of things that actually comes to mind. The first one is I remember a, a complaint by Bob Dines 
um, who you know, of course, very well, where Bob said he knew when he was getting past it, when he was asked to give talks only after dinner. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, it may be, may be too late. You know, a, 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 another one actually is, is that's common with David, is that, that, that indeed we've had a, a, a relationship which has always been convivial but occasionally adversarial. And I, the, I do remember one time where we shared the podium one after the other giving talks. And uh, at the end of my talk, which came, and this is one of them, and this is one of the things with this wonderful statement about 0.3% of solar energy on the Sahara could power Europe. I mean, it's very nice since we just took over Libya again, so we've got part of the solar uh, to, to work with. And of course, I mean, the question about things like this, you know, is it true? Is it false? Or actually, is it a fantasy? Because that's a third alternative. Um, when, you're, when you're facing bland statements like this. Um, so so the, the, the purposes of my talk actually are to try and turn you into one of those annoying armchair experts that you meet at dinner parties or at parties. And because this is what physicists are. I mean, so you understand that the role of a physicist at a dinner party is the guy who pronounces that they understand everything about everything and this is the way you should run your life because this is what we do. Um, and, and I would like to educate you to the level where you can do that and be an armchair expert because the whole point about thinking in the way you do is that it enables you to make grand uh, assumptions, prognostications. I mean, now, I, for example, now I come from Chicago. There's a famous story about Fermi who set an entrance exam uh, for students with the question being to estimate the number of piano tuners in Chicago. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, uh, so the question is, why on earth is that a physics question? Of course, it is a question about, uh, about using data wisely to make rational estimations. And if you think about that hard, it is quite straightforward to estimate the number of piano tuners in Chicago, even though when first faced with it. Right. But I, I would like you to do that with, with, with the globe. And I have a few principles, actually, uh, which I suspect will get me into trouble because I am indeed an armchair expert. And the, one of the difficulties about talking about sustainability is that invariably I know a little bit about everything. And that in the audience, there will be some expert who knows far more than I do about any single one of these topics. And I'm sure I will meet one of you tonight and he will come and, and harass me over this. But that, that's part of the point. Okay. So I, I'm, I'm going to talk about some grand principles and you'll see these coming through. And the first one, which I deeply hold, is the value of theory over data. Now this is not what we teach students, actually. We teach students that science is all about uh, the garnering of empirical knowledge and the data has primacy over everything else. And of course, that's not quite right, because you're watching, but not very much, although I'm prepared to, you know, in discussion, to talk in details about the headroom of innovation we have on transformative energy technologies, uh, in particular for generation and storage uh, of, of electricity and use and transmission. Um, uh, but in fact, not that much. I mean, some of this will come because partly because I don't have a lot of time. Um, and you know, one of the problems, and this has occurred to me, is that if you approach this subject as a scientist or as a technologist, um, you assume that there's going to be some scientific or technological fix. Right. Um, so that inherently I believe that if I invent something better, that will be it and the problem will be all fixed. And it doesn't take very long before investigating this before you realize that it is a much more complicated problem and that in particular money matters a great deal. And, so and socioeconomics matters a great deal. And that this is very an un very, a very unpredictable path. And that the scientific things that we are good at are only part of it. So there are a few things I won't talk about. I won't talk about nuclear. Uh, not because I'm anti-nuclear or anything about that. Just because it isn't really a renewable and it isn't part here. I won't talk at all about resource use or about water or things like that. Again, not because they're not important, just because it doesn't fit quite here. I'm probably not going to talk much about policy. Um, uh, and, and I won't 
talk about climate change. Well, actually, maybe I will. Um, so, in fact, I will start by talking just briefly about climate change because I want to use it to, uh, um, to tell you why theory is better than experiment. Okay. So, let's see if you believe me. Okay. So, the question is, do you believe in global warming? And what is the basis on which you would make a decision about whether global warming was actually happening? So the usual way this is presented is with a couple of graphs that look like this. This is data. So the first one is the atmospheric CO2 measured in Hawaii from 1960 to 2010, growing inexorably, uh, annual oscillations on top of it, really very solid uh, data set. Here's another one which comes again from NASA Goddard, it is the best consensus of what's called the global land ocean temperature interest, namely the average trend in the temperature of the planet. Okay. Now you sort of look at this, and that also looks like it's going up over this period. Okay. Now, you know, if you're dumb, you just sort of assume that one is related to the other, and clearly this is driving that. Anybody who do is that you use data, of course, first to build a theory, and once you have a theory which is absolutely rock solid, you are really loath to throw that out. Um, and it's very easy, particularly in this game, to get fooled by incomplete, dangerous, bad data. But there are principles going around that you should use. Um, and you know, one of them, I'll talk in a moment, actually, about global modeling and detailed modeling. And the trick is to use some rules and not lose the wood for the trees. And also, you know, to understand that the system is actually operating in a mode which I would call close to linear response. And if you don't understand what that means, I will explain it. Namely, that we're dealing with a system which is perturbative and the changes are rather small. That is also not what you will read in the literature. Because people are full of feedback and nonlinearities and stuff like that. But actually, there are, no, I mean, th th that's, a, that's a fiddle. I'm, I want to talk about thermodynamics of the planet because that's rather important. And we'll see that that really is critical. I'm going to talk about equipartition. So the foundation of thermodynamics is that if you put energy into a system, it disperses into all of the modes more or less equally. It's a founding, so it's why when we model a gas, you don't do it by trying to measure the velocity of every single molecule in the gas. You understand that there is something called the pressure and the volume and the temperature and that those three things are the equation of state. And the reason that you can use that is because the degrees of freedom are well mixed. And I will present you a case, actually, that the relevant degrees of freedom for renewables are all, unfortunately, for our purposes, actually very well mixed. And that makes the point, actually, that, that, that free energy isn't free. Um, uh, and it will get us to the idea of money and I will try and make the bold statement, actually, that, we're about, that, we are re that we are about to rewrite the laws of economics in favor of thermodynamics, and that actually money is now energy. Um, so I don't know whether you will buy any of this, but I hope it will produce some debate. Okay. So, okay, so what, what I'm actually going to talk about, I'm going to talk about thermodynamics of the planet, large-scale physics. I will talk about... Uh, sources and sinks of renewable energy, where we can get energy from, where it has to go, and point out some of the global problems that we have to deal with, in particular, why, although there is plenty of energy around, it's dispersed so broadly that any, all of our renewables will have to be deployed on scales which are country-sized. Okay? And that's an important result. I will talk 